real estate prop techs take the jump. I'm Steve Weichel. I'm the head of industry relations at the MIT Center for Real Estate and also the real estate tech lead for our real estate innovation lab. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is a topic, uh, topic that I am deeply involved with and excited to be a part of. Uh, the area of technology and innovation and how it's impacting the, the real estate industry. And um, so before we begin, a couple, of, uh, a couple of housekeeping issues. If you could please all mute your sound and turn uh, off your video. For those who are participants, uh, mute your sound and turn off your video. And uh, I'll uh, introduce our topics, uh, the speakers and the sharks, and then tell you a little bit about how the uh, process is going to go today. And also as a reminder, be sure to uh, address your Q&A through the chat feature on, uh, on Zoom. We'll be monitoring that. And we'll also have some polling questions that will come up uh, during the program. So let's get right to it. Uh, I am delighted to welcome our presenters today, Laura Patel from Density. She's the Director of Strategic Accounts. Also, Andrew Flint, co-founder of Occupier. Bridget Beltran, who's the East Coast Director of Workplace Solutions at Saltmine and Jake Snyder, founder and CTO at TrackFlow. And they're all going to tell you about what they're, uh, the exciting things that they're working on. And of course, our sharks. Welcome, <laughs> sharks. Uh, Megan Riley, who's the growth lead for the Americas at JLL Spark. Gus Vasquez, who's the senior project manager at Viacom CBS. Gus, is that your dog that joined us? I don't know. Uh, Stan Gibson, senior vice president of real estate at Wells Fargo. And Kurt Ochala, uh, head of global real estate at Biogen. So uh, welcome sharks, nice to have you with us. Welcome presenters. And uh, with that, we will, uh, we will go ahead and begin with a polling question. Let's look at our first polling question that's going to come up. Here we go. Which presentation are you most interested in hearing about? I don't know, this is sort of a fake out for the presenters right at the beginning, but anyway, uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, everybody, everybody uh, go ahead and take a shot at that. And we'll see how the, uh, how the results turn out in a moment. And then we'll move right on to the presenter. And do we have results? We may not. We'll, uh, ah, here we are, here we are. Density 47%, Occupier 35%, salt mine 16%, track flow 2%. I think that's going to change as we move along here as we hear about these exciting new things. So with that, I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, density and so uh, Laura Patel, I will uh, I will turn it over turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome, and I'm going to hope that that doesn't change because uh, I hope we, we <laughs> stay enough. in the as a front runner for the rest of the hour. Um, so hey everyone, my name is Laura Patel, and I'm here today to tell you about how we're using artificial intelligence to help tenants and owners better understand how people use space uh, accurately, anonymously, and in real time. So why would anyone care about how space is used? Well, the reality is uh, that annually, the data tells us that we spend about $150 billion a year on space that's paid for, but actually vacant. And this is a huge and expensive problem for most companies, um, but in fact, it's an unnecessary one, given the availability of technology that can help us to better understand our spaces, uh, really liberating tenants to help make decisions on the fly to optimize them. So before I jump into how we do that, uh, a little about us. So we were founded in 2014. Uh, we recently completed our Series C raise led by Kleiner Perkins to the tune of $51 million. Um, and our leadership and engineering team hail from the likes of NASA, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple. And we are all American. Um, so we are headquartered in San Francisco and we actually do uh, all of our manufacturing in uh, upstate New York. So how do we count people? Uh, well, we are what's called a threshold-based sensor, uh, which in simple terms basically just means that we mount above any point of entry into a space. Uh, so that can be a really simple three-foot wide door like what you see here, uh, or it can be a really, really wide hallway. Um, so here you have a 20-foot wide hallway entrance, and we've daisy-chained three sensors together that are working as a team uh, to monitor this 20-foot wide um, entryway into a cafeteria space. So the thing that these two spaces have in common, although they look dramatically different, uh, is that they both represent uh, thresholds across which humans would have to travel when exiting one space and entering another. 
The way that we actually count the humans uh, is we use an infrared laser, which is being cast out of the device, and it's basically bouncing off of everything it comes in contact with, and it's returning what are called depth dimensions back up into the sensor. So if I was to walk below the sensor for half a second, it would literally in that half a second collect hundreds of thousands of little readings about me. Uh, so those little depth dimensions, returning them back up into the sensor. And over the course of a full second, uh, the sensor's collecting literally millions of those little data points. And when we stitch all of those together to kind of render what the sensor sees, it looks a little something like this. Um, so really easy for us with these huge human brains uh, to understand what's going on in this frame. The door opens and then four people walk through. This is really confusing for a machine if left to its own devices without further support. Uh, and that's what would typically lead to an erroneous or an inaccurate count. And so we take that a step further and we put all of those data points I was describing before through a series of sophisticated algorithms, which have been trained to help the machine distill that really complicated information and to pare it down to only the things we want it to care about, which in this case um, is the human beings that are either coming or going from a space. So how do we use that um, to, to help address applicable business use cases? Well, prior to the pandemic, uh, we had three core benefits that we provided organizations, uh, helping them to enhance physical security through tailgating detection, pairing with other technologies, uh, like some of what you're going to hear after me from my fellow presenters to help um, achieve other benefits within the workplace. So pairing, for example, with a room scheduling system where we would say, hey, somebody booked this room, but they didn't show up. Let's not let it go vacant for the next 50 minutes. Let's release it back out into open inventory. Or, hey, you've had a whole bunch of humans through your cafeteria. We're probably running low on the 50 flavors of nuts uh, and all of the fruits. Uh, you may want to have someone to come by and, and top those up. And most importantly, helping organizations uh, optimize their portfolios. Answering questions like, of all of the buildings in our portfolio, which one of them is the most underutilized? And really quickly, we can see, well, that's five Hanover Square. And is all of five Hanover Square really performing poorly or is it just certain floors? And we can see again, really quickly, that you know the, the VS, VES department on floor three is the worst offender, but actually across the stack, almost every department and every floor within this building is doing poorly. So we're really uh, oversubscribed in terms of the amount of space. And is it the whole floor or is it certain rooms? Um, so room 202, we can see that it's actually used 92% of the time, which is awesome. That's what we like to see, or at least what we did prior to the pandemic. But unfortunately, it's actually used incorrectly. So it's designed for four people, um, and yet 45% of the time, only one person's using it, and 28% of the time, two people are. So 75% of the time, it's actually being used by half the amount of people it was designed for. Jumping forward into the pandemic use cases though, because uh, obviously organizations are concerned about different challenges as it relates to how to optimize their spaces. In response to the pandemic, we took that really valuable information that was previously being aggregated behind the scenes to drive long-term strategy and decision-making. And we're now making it available in real time to help support organizations with their safe return to work strategies. So the first way in which we're doing that is this live display. So taking that data and making it available for me as an employee or as a guest so that when I show up at the space before I've even entered it, I know whether or not it's safe for me to do so. And if it's not, I have a wait time. So I know how long exactly I'm probably going to have to hang out before I can go in. And if I don't need to go to the first floor, maybe I could go to the second floor instead. I have a little legend on the right hand side that lets me know if there's another amenity or another space within the building that I could travel to instead. And this goes for smaller spaces as well. So restrooms, um, ironically, have become one of the scariest places in a workplace uh, because they're one of the most uh, tightly uh, impacted in terms of the occupancy or the design for capacity of them. We don't really know if we're putting ourselves in harm way until we enter it. And so again, being able to see before I enter that space whether or not it's safe for me to do so as an employee or a guest, I'm empowered to take control of my own safety. And it also reinforces that it, it is safe for me to be there and that there are different investments in place to ensure my safety. And then if I can't go into that bathroom, being able to see where there may be a different restroom on the floor that I could travel to and access immediately. And this is true for any shared spaces that may be harder uh, for us to monitor. Uh, just because they don't have assigned seats. So cafeteria spaces, fitness centers, locker rooms, um, or in some Manhattan buildings, roof deck or common public areas. 
Secondly, uh, obviously we hope employees make safe decisions, but if they don't, employers are looking for a way to have a built-in insurance policy where they can ensure that their employees are being kept safe, uh, even if they're not making those decisions for themselves. And so we've built a robust alerting platform within our platform itself where, okay, so the legal capacity of the second floor may be 600, but the target capacity or it's designed for capacity is 280. And right now, because of the pandemic, we're only allowing 50% of the workplace back. So I'm able to go in and send an alert to either get an email or a text message. And because it's at 50%, we're gonna set that alert to be uh, 140 people. So I wanna get a text message anytime the occupancy of this space exceeds 140, and I also want to get a, an escalation notice. So for every 10 additional people that come in. So the way this is saved, um, I'll get a text message at 141 people and then 151 and then 161 and so on and so forth. And I can also go ahead and do this in our mobile app if that's easier, in which case I'll just get a mobile notification similar to when you get a Facebook message. Laura, and you lastly, have one usage. Remaining. Awesome, I'm gonna come in under that. Uh, so lastly, uh, using this for things like usage-based cleaning. So that same alerting system, uh, but being able to drive janitorial tickets, either using our platform's alerts or feeding us into an IWMS system where we would be helping your janitorial staff to clean space in response to actual usage as opposed to an arbitrary static schedule. Um, so one of the owners that we just installed with, for example, across their 20 uh, floor um, skyscraper, we were able to tell them that certain floors were receiving five times the usage of other floors and some floors were actually not used at all. So rather than them wasting time cleaning spaces that hadn't been used since the last time the janitorial staff serviced them, they're able to make more efficient use um, of that team's time in directing their efforts in response to actual foot traffic. So that's it for me. Excellent, Laura, thank you. Uh, AI, sensors, uh, COVID solutions, all wrapped up, great stuff. Sharks, please jump in and ask questions. Hey, Laura, I'll kick off. This is Dan Gibson with Wells Fargo. Great presentation. How you predicted COVID back in 2014 is beyond me. Um, congrats for doing that. Um, <clears throat> just a question, uh, as you have these sensors, who designs and makes those and are you kind of limited to scale up given their ability to uh, 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 produce them, uh, install them? Um, are you dependent on one, uh, uh, on, on one company for that? And then the second maybe question on top of that is have you looked at other industries? I know when I go to Trader Joe's I have to stand outside for 15 minutes until people walk out and there's a counter uh, uh, letting people in and letting them out. Um, I don't know if, if you've looked at other industries, but can you maybe comment on that as well? Thank you and a great presentation. Thanks, Dan. Um, so the, the first part of your question, um, we are the designer and the manufacturer. So I feel really lucky I get to work beside people that are literally writing algorithms and designing hardware all day. Um, I just get to be the pretty face that comes out and shares that really exciting story. Um, so we are the, the manufacturer of it end to end from design to construction of the devices. In terms of how they're implemented, um, not to underplay the sophistication of the system, but literally whoever is pulling the wire for a client is typically the one that actually installs the devices. The heavy lift is, is the accuracy and the provisioning that happens in behind the scenes and that's all, all done remote by our team. Um, so we do have a, a global network of resellers that we work with, um, and that's typically how clients choose to go. But when we're working with really large organizations, they typically have a vendor that they know and trust. And in those instances, again, um, we would just go through a short certification process. And then anyone who is either um, doing AV integration or pulling wire uh, would be certified to install the device. In terms of um, other industries that we've looked at, um, I'd be lying if I said pre-pandemic, we, we were focused um, you know, outside of commercial real estate. We work mostly with Fortune 500 organizations and higher ed. However, in the wake of the pandemic, within the first few months, um, we suddenly became the accidental safety company that was working with uh, essential businesses to help them stay open. Um, so we worked with a lot of um, food processing, uh, manufacturing facilities, distribution centers, um, and even an entire town um, who had to keep their, their council coming into the office. And so we went from being very CRE focused to suddenly working with any organization who, who really needed uh, tools and assistance to be able to safely keep their people in, in the office. Great. Other sharks? Hey, Laura. Oh, and Megan from JLL Spark. 
So a concern we're hearing from a lot of our occupier clients that in addition to measuring occupancy on a floor, they're also interested in um, monitoring social distancing on the floor to ensure that their people are actually staying six feet apart, not crowding around a desk. Do your sensors have the ability to detect um, kind of these unsafe interactions, we'll call them? No, and that was by design. Um, our platform is by design completely anonymous and we're not actually tailing people into the space. Um, I'm sort of at odds as an employee or the beneficiary of, of that type of technology. I don't know that I want to get a shock if I happen to walk a bit too close to a colleague. We by design chose to take a little bit of a different approach, which is we want to empower employees to make safe decisions and to know that they can safely enter a space, less so on the like policing if I happen to get a little bit too close to my colleague. So um, no, we don't know where you go within the space once you're there. Got it. Great. Thank you. Hi, Laura, quick yeah, question no on uh, privacy. So in my experience, um, the privacy issues in EMEA are much more significant than the US and um, this appears to take the anonym anonymity out of it. So has it been proven and used in those markets where workers councils and other um, countries in EMEA don't allow tracking of employees? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest difference between our platform and other sensor technologies is other sensor technologies are doing what's called um, destroying the, the PII or the information at the edge. So they are collecting PII, but then they're destroying it before it leaves the device. Um, we're actually anonymous at the source. Um, so we have no way by design of ever even collecting PII. And so because of that, we are innately uh, GDPR compliant and we're installed globally in about 35 countries uh, across every continent at this point. Great, thank you. Hey Laura, uh, this is Gus. Um, well, first yeah. of all, one of the things I really like about it is like you talked about the anonymity of it. Also just the, the, the workplace efficiency aspect of it of finding you know um, what conference rooms are being used and how spaces are actually being used, which is great information for future projects as well. Um, question I had is, for the devices installation, I already spoke about it earlier, but are any of the devices have an option to be wireless? And, um, and also, how is the information shared with employees? Is there a mobile app or is it just on screens on the wall like you showed in the presentation? Yeah, so from a connectivity standpoint, um, we don't need to have a, a hard line data connection. We can also tap into a Wi-Fi network and we can also use just a wireless LTE router. Um, so there doesn't need to be a hard connection to the network. In terms of um, employees accessing that data, they can either use our Density Live page, which is just a free page that we offer. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. So we would white label this for a client, uh, making whatever floors available that they wanted their employees to see. Most clients at this stage though, are using some sort of employee experience app, whether that's you know CBRE host or, or the likes. And so in that instance, we have a completely open API and we would just use that API to actually feed the occupancy data into whatever app the employees were already leveraging. And the same goes when we're working with owners for tenant experience apps. Excellent, Laura, thank you for a terrific presentation. Thank you, Sharks, for really great questions. Uh, moving right along now. Uh, before we do though, just a reminder for those of you who are attending, you can send in questions through the chat function and we will have a Q&A for attendees at the end, uh, which uh, will uh, be able to answer any questions that didn't come up during the, uh, during the process with the uh, review by the Sharks. So moving along now uh, to occupier, Andrew Flint, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, let me share my screen. And then present. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrew Flint. I'm one of the co-founders of Occupier. We're a real estate success platform that enables tenants and tenant or brokers to make better real estate decisions. Um, the COVID is a topic, a popular topic, obviously. Um, the impact of COVID over the past couple of months has really forced a lot of companies to re rethink how they're using real estate. Hence, you know, tools like Density, which are making a, a positive impact. Um, when you look at March and April and May and the headlines that were coming out then, one might have thought that, you know, the office was going to become obsolete. But what's been really interesting to see with our clients and talking with the industry, that while companies needed to work from home to kind of survive, uh, many have found that the extended work from home can have a negative impact on their business. So projects are taking longer. 
Um, hiring is more complicated, integrating employees and training employees. Um, employees are feeling less connected. Uh, so while this was essential for keeping employees safe, it's something that's not sustainable long term. And you can hear, you know, Bruce Moser from Cushman say that, you know, one thing that, he, that we've definitely figured out is that people like, want, and appreciate the office hub. So, you know, the office isn't going anywhere um, and commercial real estate isn't going anywhere in general. Um, and with that, companies are being forced to, again, rethink their real estate. So they're really focused on a bunch of core areas that are kind of resurfacing and getting more priority um, than ever. One is geography. Um, are we, you know, where do we need space? Uh, who works from home and how often? Is the workforce centralized or is it distributed across multiple satellite offices? Uh, how do we use space? Um, you know, it's estimated that 30, 50% of space goes underutilized. Um, you know, utilization is getting more um, uh, focused than ever just because of how employees should be interacting when they do come in. You know, how much are we spending on real estate? Real estate has historically been one of the, you know, second, third largest expense of any business out there. And um, with that, you know, with your spend, you know, how is that impacting your financials? So if you do an issue got financial statements, as a private company by the end of next year, you're going to have to be compliant with new accounting standards. So this increased focus um, has really added this additional layer of complexity of how companies align their real estate with the operational needs of their business. Now take into account all of the people that are involved and that's what we've seen as a growing number of people um, that's adding an additional layer of complexity to what really has historically been this you know, somewhat sophisticated game of telephone, which has been a result of really poorly designed technology that occupiers and brokers have been relying on. A lot of outdated archaic systems and processes that rely heavily on Excel and PowerPoint and Word. Introducing occupier. So we have built a real estate success platform for both tenants and tenant brokers to work in conjunction with additional stakeholders to collaborate around key real estate data and decisions. So tenants and brokers are relying on occupier in three core areas. First is a modern lease administration tool. So something that actually is easy to use and makes your core real estate data accessible. So this is where are we located? What other key portfolio data do we have? You know, cost tracking, automated critical date notifications that ensure that we are aligning a business decision to a key decision we need to make that's associated with our lease. Also access to key documents and all of this, but all of the different people that might have some stake in a real estate decision. Collaborative deal management. So as you have a business initiative or something from a lease that triggers you to make a real estate decision, how do you collaborate with all of the different people on start to finish deal tracking? Most importantly, dynamic site selection. So you can get to that point, how do we truly evaluate whether our existing location or alternatives are best fit for our requirement? And what we'll be launching in the fall is an ASC 842 compliant lease accounting module. So seamlessly connecting your core lease administration data to your accounting and finance teams that need it to be able to close their books, run full amortization um, schedules uh, and uh, comply, uh, complete their journal entries. Brand names leveraging Occupier today include DraftKings, Indeed, Discover Financial, DocuSign, Shake Shack, and top brokerage teams from major firms across the country like JLL, Newmark, uh, and TBRE. A couple of case studies. Um, Indeed, when they initially came on, their entire goal as a team was to improve the decision-making process around all of the different people that are involved uh, within their organization. For them, that was their real estate team, finance, their workplace strategy team, HR, AV and IT, business unit leads, as well as their third-party CBRE brokerage uh, teams. So for them, as a result, which they quickly saw over a couple of months, is they improved their decision-making process, which enabled them to not only execute a deal, but actually get their operations up and running faster than they had before. On the brokerage side, 
JLL Chicago. Their entire goal was to centralize their transaction process to improve the communication, one, with their client, but two, with the local market brokers that they work with in different cities as they are representing um, their core client base, client base that has a multi-market um, reach. For them, they improved client relationships, um, they sped up their deal process, uh, and they are starting to actually pitch this as a tool as part of their platform to actually win business. Uh, for Occupier, we're really in phase one right now. We're really focused on improving the workflow across lease administration, transaction management, and accounting. So kind of bringing an industry that has been um, kind of relied on poor technology in the past and kind of bringing it into the 21st century in terms of easy to use accessible technology. Phase two, we really want to focus on systems integrations. So how can we integrate with internal ERP systems, HR systems, you know, tools like a density so we can understand how people are actually um, kind of using their space, uh, maybe third party demographic data. How does that layer into not uh, both lease administration, but also the transaction management piece to help facilitate decisions? How do we use that data to be more prescriptive and facilitate decision making? And fourth, how do we start to take the demand that's being created in Occupier and service that in a manner that really puts the tenant and their broker on a much more level playing field with the landlord in terms of determining what is the best space that fits our need and what are the best terms that uh, apply to that as well. So at Occupier, we believe that like many other industries, you know, this is one where, that will ultimately happen online. And our goal is to build a software platform that enables that frictionless lease management decision-making business for the tenant, the tenant or broker, and all of the other different parties that are involved. So our whole goal for you is how do, you, um, how do we let you take control of your real estate for your business? Andrew, excellent. Uh, this is great. Both of, you, both of you came in under the wire. So uh, we're keeping right on schedule. And uh, so, uh, Occupier, uh, lease portfolio optimization, workflow and process optimization, and uh, soon to be accounting and administrative uh, integration. Really terrific. Thank you for that. Sharks, feel free to jump in. I can start. Um, hey, it's Megan from Spark. Um, I know you previously worked for VTS. I'm curious how you'd respond to the concern that VTS might enter the Occupier space. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Uh, uh, you know, we have very good relationships with them uh, with VTS. We were there for a long time. Um, you know, from everything when we talk to them and everything we understand, they are so heavily focused on the landlord, um, continuing to evolve their legacy tools, but also this new marketplace uh, launch is certainly not a light lift. Um, we ideally think that down the road we are uh, a very synergistic platform um, to people like VTS. Um, mm -hmm. And that it's really, it's, it's a separate business, uh, to be honest with you, but separate target market, separate tools. It's, it would be a very heavy lift. Um, although, you know, you can never say never that they wouldn't try it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Other sharks. You know, Andrew, uh, this Dan Gibson, I had kind of a similar question, kind of along those lines, what are you the best at doing? And, uh, but what are the modules that maybe you've left out so far? You covered a couple of those when you talked a little bit about workflow and systems integration. But what are the what are the modules that maybe you've left out by design? Maybe you want to tackle them in the future. Maybe you haven't yet. <clears throat> um, but uh, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I know some of the bigger IWMS uh, systems, you know, probably have multiple modules. They might have a few more uh, in their uh, in their holster. But uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the future and what you're going to add to this? Yeah, I mean, first off, I think what we're really good is building, um, you know, easy to use and accessible technology for those three core areas, transaction, lease admin, and lease accounting. Um, where we want to go in the future, what we haven't done yet on purpose because of, you know, this, the stages we know that we need to kind of get through as a business is the data piece. So we think there's a huge opportunity in the future where you can start to layer in other data sets uh, based upon integrations with other tools that you're using. Um, the static component of lease administration um, could be is something that there's an opportunity for it to be so much more dynamic. Looking at a space, understanding how you're performing based upon its use, based upon 
you know, your revenue to rent um, ratios, whether you're an office user or retail. So all those things in terms of layering in your own data based upon other tools that you use, you use for your business um, is something that can be extremely powerful in terms of helping you make your own decisions and understanding actually how you're actually using real estate yourself uh, as a company. That's probably phase one down the road. We get into then kind of much more aggregate anonymous data. Um, we think there's huge opportunity from the transaction piece that, to drive um, data based upon like truly leading indicators about what companies are going to do in the future. Um, because when you look at that process, it takes a long time, six, 12, 18 months, depending on the size. So kind of understanding some of the aggregate components of that data early on can be um, really powerful market indicators. Great, thanks, Andrew. I, I can go next. Um, my, from a project management perspective, uh, I was interested in the alerts that uh, the, the software can give you for TI reimbursement, commencement dates. How does the software capture that lease data? Does somebody have to enter it or does it capture it somehow? Yeah, we assist you with onboarding all of your initial information right now. We have a, a team that does that. Um, that can take structured data or actually abstract leases and get it into the system. Um, we've also built the transaction tool as well to, as you're negotiating a deal of structuring core components of that transaction, is being able to immediately turn that into something that you can track from a lease administration perspective. We think there's a huge opportunity that you can, uh, let me take a step back, we think the process of lease abstraction overseas in India or the Philippines is actually a broken process. You go through 12 months of negotiating a deal and then you send a 100 page PDF lease document to someone that um, has no insight into what, what decisions were made and why and you're charging that person with kind of uh, taking core data out of it. We think you can structure that along the way and more inherently then start to track a more accurate data going forward. So we've already built tools to help facilitate that and transitioning from a, a done deal to uh, a lease that you're tracking in your lease administration uh, module. That's great, thanks. A quick question on adoption. So early in my career, I worked for <clears throat> a firm called Workplace IQ, which had $10 million investment from four of the largest brokerage firms in the country, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, part of that was Project Octane, which is developing the transaction piece of what you were talking about. And despite each of those firms two and a half million dollar investment, they could not agree on what that system should do. So I'm curious, um, brokerage is highly fragmented outside the large firm. So what's adoption been within the larger firms? Are the, is it just small teams that are using it or are you talking really high levels in the organization about full adoption with uh, the major brokerage houses? Um, we are taking a kind of a parallel approach, but more, more heavily focused right now on a bottoms up approach. Um, we learned a lot in doing this at BTS in terms of selling into the landlord and the landlord agent. Um, also from our experience of working at the big firms, I was at uh, JLL for about seven years in New York. Um, you have to get adoption from the individual brokers um, for the, um, you know, the, the top brass to pay attention. Um, and to do that, you have to think about building tools for the brokers um, that actually make their lives easier. So thinking about their day-to-day -day functions rather than the reporting components first. I'm mean, gonna think that's where a lot of the firms mess up in terms of trying to implement or build their own technology and that's where we've had a lot of success. For us, what's been really cool to see is that our organic growth has been based upon a team, like I mentioned in JLL Chicago, um, having a deal for a client of theirs in a different city, bringing on that, you know, uh, aligning with a broker in that city to help coordinate on that deal, them being an occupier for a specific transaction, liking it so much, and then signing up for their own licenses to manage their own client base. Um, that sort of um, adoption has been really awesome to see um, in terms of our own growth and people kind of really engaging with it. Okay, excellent questions, excellent discussion. Andrew, thank you very much. Now it's time for a poll. Our second polling question. Second polling question, which shark is most compelling to you right now? <laughs> uh, which shark is your favorite? Okay, this is poll number two. I don't know, these are, these are tough questions. Okay. It's a meaty one. Yeah. <laughs> Take uh, take thirty take fifteen seconds to uh, to to click. 
Good thing we've heard from all the sharks. Everybody go ahead and submit and we'll get the results. And this also gives us a pause for a moment. Okay, here we go. Uh, Stan, nice. Stan Gibson, Wells Fargo, 38%. Megan, uh, close second, 34. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gus, and then, and then Kurt. So uh, we, we should probably do this uh, a little later on as well. But anyway, th <laughs> thanks everybody for playing along with us. Again, thank you Sharks for these, uh, these great questions. Okay, moving on to our third presenter. Um, I'm pleased to present, uh, to introduce Brigitte Beltran, who's at Salt Mine. She's the East Coast Director of Workplace Solutions. And Brigitte, with that, I will turn it over to you. But I think you need to unmute, Brigitte. Sorry about that. There Thank you. We go. Sorry about this. <laughs> and uh, great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to uh, introduce Saltmine to you all. And uh, I guess today, uh, what I'm uh, going to do is talk to you about uh, our company. So we are. Um, basically based in San Francisco. We do have um, an office in New York and we're about 130 people in the world. Um, as far as our uh, value proposition, we do focus on um, um, the workplace, obviously in the reality workplace strategy, uh, programming and design um, uh, focus. The, um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the uh, speaking to you about uh, new social distancing product offering that uh, we have developed to optimize employee workplace reentry in the short and long term. But before I do so, I want to talk to you a little bit about SouthMind as a technology company and how we basically fit in the value chain, the corporate real estate value chain. So when you look at um, technologies and that have disrupted uh, the operations of companies in the last 20 years, there are many that have been on the marketplace that have disrupted finance, sales, HR, and you name it. But in corporate real estate, we're a little bit behind. In recent years, we have had a bunch of different companies that have come on the marketplace and, you know, such as my colleagues today that are presenting on the this transaction side or on the build and manage side. But when you look at the, the, the middle trench here in the design phase, um, there is very little that has been done. And what we are seeing is that there is, um, we designed the way we used to design 100 years ago. The process is very linear. So when you think about a workplace strategy that is given today, it's given as a PDF or PowerPoint. It is then given to some to a planner who's going to do the program for the project in an Excel spreadsheet. Then given to somebody else who's going to do the design either in CAD or Revit and the budget in another format. This is what we speak about when we speak of from a fragmentation. And Southmind comes to really disrupt that, to look at, okay, how are we going to go from this linear process where when you're into the workplace strategy, and then you evolve, you know, in the context of your project, you're having quantity and costing. It is very difficult to go back to your workplace strategy. We're going to transform that into an agile process that's going to look at, basically, you're going to be able to go back to your workplace strategy, whether you're in the concept design, in your 3D, in your quantity and costing, and really work in a more effective and in a smarter way, basically. So now I'm going to introduce to you what I was hoping to speak about today, which is really like the uh, the workplace rent-free package that, that we developed around like optimizing the, um, the employees' workplace reentry and looking at it not only um, in the short term, in, whether in September or in January, but how we're going to you know evolve and as, as the pandemic evolves or hopefully uh, disappear, how we're going to organize our, our workplace reentry and the workforce. As such, I want to introduce you to South, the Southline platform here. And uh, the, this is the first page. When you arrive on the platform, you're going to have your entire real estate portfolio with all your assets on the map here. On the, on the left at the bottom, you're going to have all your projects around the world in which the phase, with the phase which they are at. On the right, you're going to have your density and cost and summary view for your entire real estate portfolio. As I zoom on one region, and in this case on the New York region, my apologies, not sure what happened. As I zoom on the, um, on the New York region, um, there you go. Um, I do have the same thing for the, the region itself, right? For all the projects in that region and basically a summary of the density cost and summary view for that region. Now I'd like to take you to um, 
the um, to a project itself. And here you can see a floor plan. And I want to show you what the the, uh, the acceleration and the optimization of your space things here. So we're going to start with basically selecting the entire floor plan here and looking to optimize the space. So I selected it. And basically I'm going to add the distance frame and I'm going to look at, okay, what are those spaces that are uh, non-compliant right now? And as you can see, pretty much my entire floor plan is not compliant. So I'm going to zoom on one of those rings. And then I'm going to go back to saying, OK, let's just optimize the entire floor plan very quickly. And as you can see, it's a matter of two or three clicks. And basically, the intelligent algorithm are going to are presently uh, optimizing my space. And as I pull back here, my entire space was optimized. So. As I zoom back on one specific area here, this workstation, so you can see that the spaces in green are the places where I can sit, and the ones underneath that are that is, um, transparent, I cannot obviously sit on it. Now, the, um, going back to that specific area, I'd like to talk to you about the phase reentry planning and the fact that you can really toggle for multiple scenarios, that you're going to uh, be able to do a few things here. The first one being to be able to assign a name so here you can see that we uploaded a bunch of names of all the employees for that specific floor. floor. And uh, I'm going to take Adam Dooley and just um, put his name there. And then I'm going to, going to um, create groups because let's say we decided that for this, um, for this floor, for the entire building, we're going to have group A that's going to be in the office on week one. And then we're going to have group B that is going to be there on week two. So as such, what I can do here is basically for Adam, I can decide to put him in group A or group B as, you know, as I wish and change it as needed. And uh, here we go. So the idea around this, I just showed you with, uh, based on you know, one person and, and in a group. However, this can be done for this entire group of workstations. It can be done on workspace type setting. It can be done on the entire floor plan, you name it. The, uh, the idea here is that the, uh, the platform is very agile and it's this ability to adjust it to your needs. The um, last thing that I would like to show you here is the, um, the product catalog and the fact that, you know, we understand that you had uh, to do all this floor plan and readjust and we want to uh, also support you with social distancing products. And as such, we develop a bunch of systems, so social distancing product that I want to show you here, whether it's a task chair or workstation panel and a lot of other things such as wayfinding as you can see here or um, the graphics and sanitation you name it right so all those items can basically be pulled on the floor plan and can be uh, uh, placed there so this way you would have your uh, entire floor plan ready for uh, change communication and the last thing i want to show you here as we're speaking is um the uh the path of travel so the idea here is that there is also the fact that you know there are lots of hallways and we want to avoid people bumping into not only bumping into each other but also we want to avoid having seatings that are right there in the middle of the pathways so i want to show you what that means for that specific area as you can see here i already drew a pathway and there is a quiet lounge so i am going to select select this quiet lounge area and i'm going to optimize it like i previously showed you and I'm going to say, okay, all right, show me the distance rings. As you can see, those distance rings are colliding with the space, right? So um, as I optimize them, I mean, I don't even need to optimize them to see that they are colliding, but I'm going to do it for the sake of the exercise here. And they disappear because basically it's showing me that this space, these this seats are colliding with the pathway. As such, it is my decision to pull back, right, if I wanted to, to either pull back this entire lounge area a little bit down or to remove it from the floor plan if needed. Um, so that pretty much summarizes the overall idea of, of uh, you know, what this, the, the package can do for you. And uh, as such, I, uh, this, I'd like to close this presentation. And if you have any questions for the Sharks, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Brigitte, thank you. Uh, salt mine, data visualization, floor plan, and space use optimization, reentry tools, important right now, and compliance. So uh, lots of really uh, uh, great aspects to salt mine. I'll turn it over to the sharks for questions. 
Uh, I guess I can start off. This is Gus. Um, as an architect and a project manager, I'm always interested in finding ways to uh, make the design process more efficient. So that's interesting. Um, one question is, how do architects work with within this uh, this program? Do they upload or do they work within it? Uh, another yes. question is also is whether the, the there's modules that you can purchase separately or is it all one package? Okay. Yes, so thank you for your questions. For your first question, um, the, the answer is we do have a, a different client types. We do have the occupiers first and foremost, and we also have a network of architects uh, who uh, leverage the platform for their clients. Uh, on the going back to uh, the architects, any architects can work on the platform and can access it. If the, the occupier has it, obviously, it is very easy for them to go on the platform and do you know, work either on the programming or the, plan, the, uh, the design phase. Um, and as long as they have access, obviously, and uh, it is a training of about one hour. But if you know how to use CAD or Revit, it's, it's very intuitive and actually a lot easier. And also the question about the modules, whether you can purchase modules separately or is it all one package? Yes, so the modules are, um, it's in, you can buy them all together or you can buy them separately. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there is a module that's focusing on uh, strategy planning. There are other modules that are focusing on design and you can you can decide whichever, whichever one. We have some clients that start with the design only or planning only and some the full, the full scope. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Virginia, Megan. Um, Similar to what Gus just asked, could you talk a little bit more about your pricing model? Is this a subscription-based model or is it project-based? No, it is a subscription-based model. So basically it is per module. It is also based on the real estate square footage of the client. And, uh, then, um, and then this is how we price it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Brigitte. Um, great presentation, very interesting product, uh, particularly in today's operating environment. My question is, does this integrate with existing IWMS, IWMS systems that we might have? Um, does it just overlay on it? How, do, how does it integrate with our existing CAD drawings? So there is, there is no disruption for you in that respect because today when you pull out your drawings from CAD or Revit, you just pull them and you integrate them in your IWMS system. It is the same thing with SaltMine. Uh, I, only show, I only showed the surface, right? But you're able to pretty much pull your drawings in a CAD, a Revit format, or even a PDF format if you wanted to, and you can then integrate it into your IWMS slash CAFAM system as you like. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Brigitte, uh, Stan, great, uh, great product. Um, just a question, how do you grab market share? I know there's a lot of entrants and uh, people in workflow design. Um, how do you, uh, what's your niche? How, how are you really, uh, focusing on, uh, on on market share? So I would say 90% of our clients are occupiers. We do have a network of what we call channel partners who are some uh, large architectural firms such as IAHOK, whom we have uh, a global uh, national sorry, agreements at this point. And then we also have, we also work with Cushman and Wakefield on a national platform. Uh, we, uh, yes, and other, other companies, but uh, a mix of architects and broker, brokers and others. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions from the Sharks? Very good, Brigitte. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, moving along, Jake. There you are. Jake's up. How you doing, Jake? Good. So uh, Jake, Jake Snyder, founder and CTO of TrackFlow. Uh, we're, uh, we're a few minutes early. Jake, are you good to go? Yeah. Okay. Okay, what is a change order? Um, who here has ever watched HGTV? Um, and every one of those uh, home makeover shows, uh, mid-show there's usually some big event that happens that's going to test the budget and throw the timelines off. Uh, that's a change order. Uh, it's when your simple kitchen makeover uh, ends up here, um, becomes a much bigger than expected. Um, Change orders are unforeseen challenges to a construction project scope. Uh, an easy example is you're replacing your kitchen counters. The new counters show up and the hole for the sink is the wrong shape or size. And so now you have a change order. 
Um, it might just be $500 in uh, time and materials, but you take that into a Manhattan construction project, you know, 40 floors, 40 units per floor, and you have the $500 change that's now become $800,000. So at TrackFlow, we are a cloud-based uh, software as a service tool um, that uh, is set out to upgrade this process. Uh, we started out focused on subcontractors um, in an industry that has a severe lacking in technology. Um, and we've built up a platform that uh, manages communication between the subcontractors and the general contractors in an online collaborative space. Um, and I'm Jake Snyder, CTO of TrackFlow. Cleed, the CEO, and I both met uh, at a construction uh, major general contractor, uh, Turner Construction. Um, we both come from construction families, actually. Um, on large-scale projects, uh, like Manhattan office buildings, um, the timelines are very rigid and the work cannot stop. So the, the ethos is do the work and we'll work it out later. Um, so documentation becomes everything and uh, communication can be the difference between um, getting paid. Uh, here's a good example. In Boston, the uh, Encore Boston Casino um, uh, finished up construction about a, a little over a year ago and uh, pretty much immediately went into a dispute with uh, one of their subcontractors for over $30 million in change orders that had accrued over the project uh, life cycle. Um, a lot of times, subcontractors can end up becoming financiers to the construction industry because that money between work uh, completion and payment ends up like a no interest loan. Um, and this, this cycle can take 120 days just to get paid after the work has already been completed. Uh, and there's, a, there's so many stakeholders involved in this process. So going from the field all the way up to the owner takes time and there's just a lot of opportunity for loss uh, and uh, miscommunications. So we're leaving paper pads at home and uh, and we've, we've created this online portal that's uh, pretty easy to use and uh, allows for a lot uh, better description of the uh, issues. Um, moving it into this centralized locations also uh, allowed uh, immediate syncing with the back office. So instead of uh, writing out a paper ticket and taking it to somebody manually and then getting it back to the back office a day or two later, um, everything happens uh, instantaneously. And that documentation can be vital to getting paid and keeping things on track. We've also moved the approval process um, by uh, servicing the general contractors as well. We've been able to move the, the whole approval process digitally. Um, so this goes from the construction format out in the field um, up to the uh, price engineers and uh, the owner. And this documentation can be enhanced with uh, photos and video. And uh, all of the communication can be captured in the application for later reference. So we streamline this process back and forth and into a very uh, clean, simple arc. Um, uh, th so this uh, moves the approval up the chain quicker. And this has an added benefit of subcontractors getting paid faster um, better documentation for the general contractors and uh, less surprises for the owners. So it re really is a win-win up the entire chain. Uh, and with the proprietary data set that we're building, um, we're developing the ability to use that data to predict future changes. Um, recently, I had a conversation with a project manager who told me a uh, change order came in involving steel by the time it worked through the process uh, from the site to the owner, um, a decision was made and uh, at that point the price of steel had changed. So in the future, TrackFlow will be able to highlight that type of issue and expedite that type of uh, approval. Um, we have a few metrics currently where we've been able to improve the process for customers already. Uh, increasing revenue by reducing the losses from the paper process. Um, bringing the time to get paid down significantly and um, that money gets back to the uh, subcontractor and allows for quicker reinvestment 
getting more crews out and with the labor shortage that uh, can't hurt. And uh, it's projected that in 20, 2020, in the past year really, um, that uh, about 10 billion will be spent on technology in the construction industry. And we, we've identified our sweet spot in New York as a $95 million market. Um, uh, it, almost 2,000 projects that uh, fit into uh, what we've identified is the, where we can make the biggest difference. Uh, and even if this market shrinks, there's uh, still a lot of activity um, that's going to continue. Um, yeah, so currently we've processed $15 million in change orders. Uh, we're on over 150 active projects. And uh, minus COVID months, we've had 20% growth uh, in users, and that has picked back up um, uh, recently with our revenue actually tripling in July um, from pre-COVID. So, um, yeah, so in January, we started on one of the largest construction projects in New York, which has been a really great opportunity to really put the full scale to the test with the general contractor. Uh, and the, we've onboarded 15 subcontractors who uh, are submitting all their tickets and getting the approval through our application. And so we're extremely excited about the future of technology and construction. So it's long overdue. Um, we're actually at the moment closing our pre-seed round. So we have uh, two investors lined up and we're looking for a third to round out our um, cap table. Um, join us in the future of technology and construction. We're pretty excited about it. Jake, thank you very much. I think uh, any of us in the business have been around at least one project in our career, if not more, that, uh, that has gone off the rails. And uh, so this is uh, using technology to, uh, to deal with certain aspects of the unknown and manage risk. So uh, Jake, thank you for that. Sharks, uh, questions for Jake on track flow? Hey, Jake. Um, so at Spark, we've evaluated a ton of companies in the construction tech space. Um, and we've seen that commercial contracting is an incredibly fragmented market. How do you get traction with marketing to these smaller players in some of these local markets? Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, we had a big help by coming from the industry. Um, so we had a lot of contacts and that has really been a, a big um, bonus. Um, we also just go to sites and uh, and that has the benefit of showing that we know what we're doing. Um, a lot of the um, issues with adopting technology are feeling like it's not actually designed by for them. Um, feeling like technology is designed by software companies and um, so we're able to go in and help convince them that we our construction making software versus software making construction applications. Um, and so that's been a big benefit. Um, with COVID, uh, that's obviously harder. And our goal is always to um, work on social media. And so right now, that's uh, been a big focus is, uh, and it's been accelerated, is uh, working LinkedIn and um, the social media. And that's I mean, I can't say for sure how that's going because it's also new, but so far, I mean, it's been working pretty well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Other questions from the Sharks? I can, I can go next. Um, this is Gus. Uh, so what, what, I, what I like about this is that, you know, in our industry, it's been a problem uh, in the past, just getting change orders presented on time or in a quick and in a expedited manner um, and also getting the proper type of backup for change orders which then also causes more delays if it's not the proper backup and has to go through the process again um, so you know my questions some of my questions are how how that kind of helps speed up the process um, also what you just mentioned um, about information the data on the percentage of the types of change orders would be good to have for the future but um, so, the, you know, the two questions is how, how that helps um, have better backup. And also, um, you know, related to Megan's question, 
sophistication of the of the subcontractors is sometimes an issue in using technology and if there's been an issue with that or how how this software might might help that situation yeah yeah so better backup i mean uh that that one's kind of easy um get, getting this digital process uh automatically allows for so so much better documentation um one of the <laughs> when we started doing uh construction software uh, like say eight years ago now, um, getting people to use technology, like a foreman in the field especially, uh, was like pulling teeth. Um, it's very different in the past few years. And that's mainly because of smartphones. Um, I, 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 regularly, I talk to a foreman who's never even used a computer in his life, but he has an iPhone in his pocket. Um, so that, that's been a really big change. And I think that kind of addresses both the questions a little bit. Um, but having that smartphone allows for video, photos. I mean, no longer are we just writing out a paper ticket. We can quickly snap a photo of the issue and, uh, and the work that was completed. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big bonus. And uh, that, that fast process, I mean, I can write out the ticket, take a photo, send it to the superintendent. I mean, that all happened in minutes um, versus the paper process that didn't have any of that backup. And, uh, and, and I still have to carry it to him and get him to sign it and then take it back to the back office, which may happen who knows when. It's the next time I'm in the, at the office. Um, well, thanks. I, I think I your second question, no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, thank you. I think it's just a really good simple uh, tool it doesn't try to do too much. It's, it's great. Thank you. Hey, Jake, uh, real quick, it's Ken. Um, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for carving out the time for this. Uh, with your investors, I'm sure that they, uh, they would probably want to scale the business, but yet uh, New York is, seems to be kind of your dominant market where you feel there's enough market share. You still feel that way with COVID, uh, that that's going to give you enough market share uh, to kind of satisfy the investors in kind of the future? Yes. I mean, in the immediate future, there's uh, tons of room for growth. And our focus on New York is just about simplicity for the moment. I mean, we're not against uh, uh, being on a project in Chicago. Um, we just, it's just the simplicity of the sales cycle mainly for now. Um, and there's so much room. Um, it also helps that it's a market that we know really well. And these things do change regionally to some extent. So that we're not going to stay in New York. That's not gonna be the end goal. It's just our initial beachhead. Yeah, great, thank you. One last question, Jake. Does your system integrate with other traditional project management systems or is, there, is that in your roadmap somewhere? It is in the roadmap. Um, it doesn't, right now. Um, we are working on an integration with Procore, which is the biggest uh, technology provider in construction. Um, they don't, they do change orders. They, they, they don't do it in a great way. And it's all very focused on the uh, general contractor. Um, so coming at this from the subcontractor side has allowed us to make a tool that uh, subcontractors are more likely to use. Um, so we are working on an integration with Procore um, to get the, uh, to help with the general contractor management in the place where they're already managing everything else. Um, and there's a lot of great tools that Procore has for that API and they have a uh, ability to actually get your app into their marketplace. Okay, great. Sharks, any other questions? Good. Uh, I'm going to actually ask all of the presenters to come back in. We have some questions from the audience. And uh, so, uh, 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 welcome back, everybody. Um, questions for, and, and a reminder, anybody who wants to chat a question in, we will, uh, we will grab it and, um, uh, and ask the question for you. Uh, track flow question um, for Jake uh, regarding revenue model and pricing. Um, we already answered a question about integration and, or, or, and a question about integration for scheduling, existing scheduling software. So two questions, um, pricing, uh, your pricing model, and then also, how do, Ed, can you integrate with scheduling software? Yeah, so right now, um, 
the pricing is pretty simple. It ends up being a hundred dollars a user for the subcontractors. Uh, and that's how we started out. Um, now that we're working with general contractors, um, there's also uh, a monthly fee uh, for the general contractors. I think it's about a thousand dollars a month right now. Um, and we are working on uh, building that up into just a full project scope where we can work with the owners and uh, and then that will probably end up just being a percentage base and cut the rest out on those projects so it gets a little complicated there's still some details that you know we're, we're still going back and forth a bit but that that generally it's a that that's the pricing and uh, scheduling integration scheduling integration oh um yeah, let me go back to the uh, yeah just a, yeah just a question about integration with existing systems although i know you talked about it a moment ago oh okay yeah yeah i mean so far just procore is what we're working on we'll yeah work. okay good so uh i keep sending those questions in but uh, i will say th uh, this has been fascinating uh lots of exciting solutions uh, this is a great time to be involved with real estate and especially real estate technology there's so much uh so much to do and i think COVID has accelerated the transformation that was already happening in the industry. So this is all very exciting. Uh, thank you to all of the presenters, uh, Laura Patel at Density, Andrew Flint at Occupier, Brigitte Beltran at Saltmine, and Jake Snyder at Trackflow. So uh, now here's the big moment of truth. We're actually doing this a little different. Uh, everybody who is attending, uh, we're going to do a poll and we're going to, uh, I don't wanna say pick a winner, but let's pick a favorite because frankly, all four of them were favorites of mine. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and launch the um, go ahead and launch this uh, final poll, and we'll uh, we'll all get to decide which one which one was our favorite. Density, occupier, salt mine, track flow. Uh, go ahead and take a few seconds to uh, to go ahead and submit, and we will. Uh, I don't think we're going to make this public. I think uh, I think PwC is going to give me an envelope, and we're going to uh, going to take a look at it. Now, I have noticed there have been questions in the chat about getting emails so that all four of you can be contacted. Uh, thank you for for doing that. For those of you who are attending, uh, you can certainly reach out if you want more information on on any of these solutions. I'm sure all four of you would be glad to speak to any of the attendees who uh, who are interested in that, and. Um, and we have, uh, we have a favorite. We have a favorite. Uh, today, the favorite is density. Today, the favorite is density. So uh, Laura Patel, thank you. Uh, but I will say to all of the presenters, this, was, this is great stuff. This is great stuff. And I would encourage all of the participants to read more online, uh, reach out, get more information, and, and be a part of this transformation that's happening in the industry. So uh, with that, any closing comments from the Sharks, uh, from the attendees, or from, from Cornet, New York? I think we're good. Stan, Gus, um, uh, Kurt. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, th thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Megan. Thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to doing this again. Uh, be safe, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye, guys.